Tonight, Mr. Robert Young stars in King's Row from Studio One at CBS. I haven't been very happy since I came back to King's Row. In a way, I don't like it here anymore. The people and what they stand for. And yet, King's Row is my home. We invite you to Studio One, radio's celebrated playhouse of dramatic entertainment, featuring the world's greatest stories in special versions for listening. And now to introduce tonight's great story, here is the director of Studio One, Fletcher Markle. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, a 20th century bestseller of a few years ago about a 20th century small town of many years ago. King's Row, as created and populated by Henry Bellaman, is not a frontier town, raw and new, but the kind of town that seems as if it's always been there. It looks like every town its size, from Ohio to Kansas, one of its citizens once said, and you can't tell by looking around if you're in Indiana or Iowa. But I'll leave it up to the other citizens of King's Row to tell you more about the town, principally Paris Mitchell, who is being played tonight by our visiting star in Studio One, one of Hollywood's most skillful and rewarding performers, Mr. Robert Young. With Mr. Young, you'll be hearing Mercedes McCambridge as Randy Monaghan, Leon Janney as Drake, Everett Sloan as Dr. Gordon, and tonight we introduce a young actress new to Studio One listeners as Louise, Miss Kathy McGregor. Please to begin. <laughs> Good town, King's Row. Good, clean town. Has every right to be the county seat. It's a real honest town, too. Nothing ever changes much. I'm not sure. Seems to me it's been changing all along, ever since there got to be more than one class of people here. Place gets to be a city after there's more than one class of people. I often walk out of the town and up to the hills around King's Row especially in the spring. People say to me, Paris Mitchell, you're a hermit. But I like it because as I stand up there alone in the stillness, all of King's Row is spread out before me. Most people who pass through our town and a lot of the citizens themselves think it's a pretty good place to live. Most people think that. But then most people are masters at deceiving themselves. I've known the hatreds and sins and cruelties of King's Row. I know how they've affected me and a good many others. People like Drake and Randy, whom I loved. Louise Gordon, whom I pitied. And her father, the leading physician of King's Row, whose shortcomings, both as a doctor and as a man, I came to know. Drake McHugh and I grew up together. His problems were mine and mine his. We were inseparable. That was why it was quite a natural thing, the way it all began. It was on a spring day. I was passing Dr. Gordon's house on Union Street, and I noticed Louise sitting in the garden swing with Drake. I crossed the lawn to join them. Hello, Paris. Uh, listen, this a day. Hello, you two. Here, Paris. Sit over here in the wicker chair. Oh, I just as soon sprawl out on the grass, Louise. It's much softer. But Mama doesn't like people to sit on the grass. Oh, that's right, Paris. Mrs. Gordon says it looks slovenly. Oh. <clears throat> oh sorry. Dear Mama... She's probably spying on us right now out of one of the front windows. Oh, Drake, don't say that. Mama doesn't mean to be like that. It's because she's... Well, she's so much under Papa's thumb. Dr. Gordon's pretty strict with you, isn't he, Louise? Strict? <laughs> she can't call her life her own. Papa's made me furious ever since I was old enough to realize how unjust he is. Well, he's old-fashioned, that's all. Lots of fathers are afraid their daughters will get into trouble. Papa just doesn't like me. I wonder if he likes anybody. He sure doesn't like me. You know, Paris, he's forbidden Louise to see me anymore. I'm supposed to go lose myself someplace. What's the matter with me anyway? Not good enough for your old man? If I'm not, then I don't want... Don't any... want what, Drake? Do you mean you, you don't want to see me in that case? Well, darn it all, Louise. I'm not going to sneak around and meet you on the sly. I love you, and I don't care who knows it. I told Paris so more than a year ago, didn't I, Paris? Yes, you did. I imagine Louise knows it, too. Well, what's the old sawbones got against me, anyway? Why can't I come right out in the open and go around with you like I want to? 
I may be an orphan, but my aunt and uncle were just as good as your folks. They raised me as though I'd been their own son. We've gone over all this before, Drake. Yes, and when they died, I got everything. I'm not rich, but at least I can afford to marry. I'd like to know just why Dr. Gordon's so superior. Maybe he is the leading doctor, but if you ask me, I think he's too fond of operating on people. Lots of them die that might not. Drake, stop that talk. Mama might hear. I don't care. Your father doesn't like me. All right, I don't like him either. If Mama hears, she might tell him. She tells him everything. She always takes his side. Oh, Drake, what are we going to do? You could stand up to your old man. And tell him that I'm in love with you? Yes. I did. Oh. Did you, honest? What'd he say? First he laughed. Then he said I was stupid. And that you had a questionable character. Since your aunt and uncle died, you've, you've just loafed around. You haven't worked. You've gone out with girls from the lower end of town. They were respectable girls. All the nice girls aren't necessarily in your father's circle. Oh, I didn't say they were, but on his calls and sometimes at night, Papa has seen you buggy riding with them. Louise, you know Drake isn't like that. Of course I know, but it gives Papa an excuse to say things. No, he doesn't need an excuse. But it begins to look as if you think he's right. Oh, now, have some horse sense, Guy. Louise isn't free to go against Dr. Gordon's wishes. You've got to think this thing through. All right, then. I won't see Louise again, except in church or some public place. Good dream. Louise! Oh, it's Papa. Come into the house. It's I'd pa- like to speak with you. It's Papa. I didn't expect him home so early. Hey, don't be so scared. You act like he was going to beat you. He'll be very angry. Louise! Yes, Papa, I'm coming. Goodbye, Dre. Remember, I do love you. I do. Louise, I do not appreciate disobedience. I do not expect when I issue a command to you that I must repeat that command. I wasn't being disobedient, Papa. I wasn't. Don't contradict your father. I'll handle this, Harriet. More than anything, I dislike lying, Louise. Please let me finish, Papa. I wasn't disobeying you. I was just telling Drake that I couldn't see him anymore. Well, you certainly took long enough to tell him. You were with him for a full half hour. Harriet. Yes, Henry. How often must I tell you that I shall handle the disciplining of Louise? Well, of course, Henry. You always know best, dear. I only Please thought... leave us alone. Yes, Henry, of course. Now, oh, my dear, what reason did you give Drake for not seeing him again? That you had forbidden me. That you didn't approve of him. I told you to say that you didn't care to see him. But, Papa, you you just said you didn't like lying. How dare you be insolent to me? Papa. You so cheapened yourself by this disgusting attraction for that low... Papa, don't talk that way about Drake. I love him. You can make me stop seeing him, but but you can't make me stop loving him. You little fool. Haven't you any self-respect? I love him and I'll keep on loving him. (laughs) Don't ever again say that you love him. I'll make you stop loving him, do you hear? Make you! I promise you that. I'll make you hate him. Thanks for taking this walk with me, Paris, and letting me blow off a little steam. (laughs) You do the same for me. Yeah, well, at that, you're better off than me. What do you mean? You've got brains. Oh. (laughs) Oh, it's true. You're going to Vienna and learn to be a doctor. Me, I don't know how to do anything. Oh, don't talk nonsense. Perhaps you could uh, start some sort of a business. Well, I was thinking about that. I've got my eye on that tract of land up near the school. With a little capital, a fellow could make subdivisions out of it and really clean up. Why don't you, then? I can't. I just halfway hinted it to old Curly down at the bank. He handles my money. He nearly went up in smoke. Not a cent until I'm 21. That won't be so long. (sighs) Meanwhile, until I'm legally of age, all I can do is wait and loaf. Only everybody jumps on me for being a loafer. Well, this town needs to be more understanding, more sympathetic. I get so darn lonely, Paris. You're the only friend I've got, and you're going to be leaving King's Row in September. Hello, Paris Mitchell. Uh, hello. You don't remember me, do you? Well, no, I don't... (laughs) I don't believe Drake does either. I do now, as soon as you laughed. You're Randy Monahan. Randy Monahan? <laughs> oh, it can't be. Yeah, it is. Well, I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> well, <laughs> you've certainly changed since we went to school together. You were kind of a... Kind of a tomboy? Well... Well, don't d- be embarrassed. <laughs> I know what I used to be like. 
I suppose I was like that because I was always hanging around with my father down at the yards. Well, nobody can say you're a tomboy anymore. <laughs> now I'll bet she's the prettiest girl in town. Don't you think so, Paris? Think? I'm sure she is. The prettiest girl in the whole world. Uh. Well, thanks, Paris. Where have you been all this time, Randy? Well, I was away at a convent boarding school for two years, but I've been back to King's Row every summer. Gee, it's strange how you can live in the same town and never run into each other. You people who live uptown are a thousand miles away from us. But that doesn't bother me. Not anymore. Well, I should hope not. Say, look, Randy, why don't you come along with me and take a drive out in the country, huh? Well, are, uh, are you going to Paris? Oh, he probably has some studying to do. That's usually his excuse. Studying? Yes, I... Sure, he's going to be a famous doctor. Well, <laughs> anyhow, doctor. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful, Paris. Where are you going to study in Chicago? Or maybe St. Louis? Ha, nothing like that for Paris. He's going to Vienna. Vienna? In Europe? Yeah, they have fine medical schools there. Oh, I'm sure they do. Uh, will you be gone long? Oh, four years, maybe five. Goodness, that's almost forever. Well, it never seemed so long before. <laughs> Well, never mind. There's still the whole summer ahead of us. Randy, how about that drive, huh? We can drop Paris at home. Well, why leave me out? I don't have to study this afternoon. That's the spirit. I mean, I'll come driving if Randy will. How about it, Randy? I'd love to. I arranged my schedule so that I had more free time that summer. I was able to see a great deal of Randy. And of course, Drake, too. The three of us were always together. We had a wonderful time. Oh, Randy, that was the best picnic lunch I've ever eaten. Oh, boy, I'll say. I'm about to pop. <laughs> what you need now is some exercise. Let's race. Oh, no, not me. I can't move. Oh, Ferris? Well, I'm game. I'll bet I beat. Yeah, we'll see about that. I'll show you there's some of that cowboy still left in me. Come on. <laughs> Let me take the reins, Drake. You sure you can manage, old Jasper? Well, I can try. Hey, yeah. Like this? <laughs> Wonderful, Randy. You look like one of the Valkyries. <laughs> like what? One of those Norse warrior maidens. Well, listen to Mr. Encyclopedia, <laughs> trying to show off how much you know. <laughs> I'll cut it up. <laughs> it was fun. Lots of fun that summer. Of course, the so-called social circle of King's Row wagged their tongues about Drake and me running around with the daughter of a railroad worker. She's a fast one, that Randy Monaghan. Running all over town with two men at the same time. So would you, if you only got the chance. I suppose Louise Gordon heard all about this gossip and was hurt by it. I felt pretty bad about Louise and Drake, but neither of them was strong enough to solve the problem of her father, the doctor. As for myself, I was with Randy as often as possible. Paris, it's been a wonderful day. Uh, let's walk over to that bench by the pond. We can watch the sunset from there. All right. Maybe you'd rather have gone to that church affair with Drake, just because no, I... No, no, I didn't want to go. Even if I did, I couldn't have gone. Why? Oh, because you're a Catholic and it was at the Presbyterian? Oh, no, no, not that. Well, those people wouldn't accept me. Are people really that snobbish? Oh, you know very well they are. And I shouldn't mind being snubbed, not by this time, but I do. I still do. Oh, forget about everybody in King's Row. Everybody but me. It isn't as easy as that, Paris. Doesn't what I think mean anything to you, Randy? Means just about everything. Randy, uh, I'm in love with you. No, please don't say that. It's true, I have to say no, it. No, don't. Everything about you, being with you anywhere in a room or out here in the street... Just thinking about you at night and kissing you, Randy. Your warm mouth. No, Paris, no, please. Say you love me, Randy. I love you. And I love you. Say it again, those words. I love you, yes. Yes, but that's not enough, Paris. That's we... all we need. Randy, darling, listen to me. We're going to get married now. Here, now, right away. No. We're going to get married, redhead. My family left me enough money to get started on. We can live at my house... I won't have any trouble finding a I'm job. I'm not going to marry you, Paris. But you said you love me. Oh, I do, my darling, much more than you love me, but I... Randy, you can't... No, no, let me finish. Paris, you've worked very hard. And you've been lonely. That's where I've come in. But you mustn't think that that means you're in love with me. Oh, darling, I'll prove to you how much I love you. Being lonely has nothing to do with it. 
After we're married... Ferris, I meant what I said. I love you too much to settle down in King's Row, to let you give up your medical career. Well, that's what you wanted all your life. I remember even when we were in grammar school, and I guess I loved you even then. You always talked about wanting to be a doctor. Yes, but well, this is more important. No, it isn't. In a few years, you'd be miserable. Miserable and lost. I couldn't stand seeing that happen to you. Especially if I was the cause. Uh-uh, you're going to be a doctor, Paris. And then when you come back to King's Row, we'll all be very proud of you. Then, then wait for me. If I go, will you promise to wait for me, Randy? Randy? It would be even worse if I said I'd marry you when you got back. I wouldn't let you hold yourself to such a promise. But why, darling? Can't you see? Look, I live across the tracks. Oh, you're still worried about these ridiculous standards in King's Row. If you're going to live in King's Row, you've got to accept or at least live with such standards, Ferris. Oh. Think of the difference there'll be between us after you've had four or five years of study in Europe. I'll seem like a complete numbskull. Oh, Brandy, I... You won't be abroad six months before you'll thank me for refusing you, Ferris. You'll wonder how you could ever have thought you loved me. Brandy, darling, don't. I know what I'm saying, Ferris. But I'll never, as long as I live, ever forget this summer. Let's go back now, Ferris. All right. Let's go back. I hadn't told Drake the way I felt about Randy. Perhaps I would have eventually, but... The next day, something happened to Drake, which took my mind off my own feelings. We were having lunch at Drake's house when Mr. Wakefield at the Farmers Exchange Bank phoned and asked Drake to come see him. I went with him. <laughs> Gee, they sure keep the brass doorknob shiny on this place, don't they? Yes. Banks are very elegant. Hey, you, uh, got any idea what Wakefield wants to see you about, Drake? Oh, he probably wants to tell me they finally got my account straightened out. Oh, there he is, over there, talking to Mrs. Willis. What about your account? Well, he called me yesterday, too. Said my checking account was overdrawn, $80. <whistles> yeah, but it must have been a mistake. I remember old Curly said he deposited $1,000 to my account in July. And I certainly haven't spent that much in a little more than a month. Mr. Curly's the one who handles your inheritance, huh? Yeah, he's the trustee under the will. Oh, hello there, Drake. Harris? Oh, hello, Mr. Good afternoon, Wakefield. sir. Drake, I, uh, I have something rather serious to discuss with you. Oh, perhaps I should wait outside. Oh, no, no, no. Whatever it is, you can hear about it. You might as well. The whole town will know about it before the afternoon's over. Does this have anything to do with my checking accounts you said was overdrawn, Mr. Wakefield? I'm afraid it does. You see, Mr. Curley did not deposit that $1,000 to your account as he said he did. Oh, I didn't, he? Where is he? Let's talk to him. Mr. Curley has been out of town for more than a week. Where'd he go? We thought he was going to Dallas on business. Well, couldn't we wire him down there? Well, I've already done that. Mr. Curley didn't go to Dallas. What's more, Mrs. Curley hasn't heard from him since he left. Then where is he? Well, no one knows as yet. I looked into Mr. Curley's box in the vault. It's completely empty. The president of the Farmers Exchange has left town, skipped out with every cent he could lay his hands on. You... You mean all my money? It's gone? Yeah, not only yours, but Mrs. Pettigrew's, the Hammond twins, old Mrs. Teeman, all of it. Can't you stop him? Catch him somehow? Well, we're trying, but I'll wager he's in Central America by now. We finally had his house put in his wife's name six months ago. He must have been planning this a long time. I'm afraid we'll never lay eyes on Jim Curley again. <laughs> Mr. Wakefield was right. That was the last King's Row ever saw of James Cuthbert Curley, who had always been such an outstanding citizen, pious and righteous, a leading member of the community. The town was outraged. It spent many hours sympathizing with Mr. Curley's victims. But when Drake went to them in search of a job, then it was quite a different story. Yeah, the same old answer today, Paris. They don't have a thing. I wouldn't mind so much if they were telling the truth. I know. What they mean is they don't have anything for you. Well, don't let it get you down, Drake. Everybody's not that way. Oh, they make me sick, Randy, all of them. I know what it is. And it's more than that I don't have any money now. They all think like Louise's old man. Dr. Gordon thinks I'm wild. They all do. I could be tolerated while I had money, but now... 
Uh, Listen, Drake, I, I wish you'd take some of my money. No, I, Paris, I you've got just enough to put you through medical school and get set as a doctor. I'm not touching your money. There must be a job I can get someplace. I think I know where you can get a job, Drake. You do, Randy? Where? I talked with Dad. You could get a job down at the yards, but it might not be the kind of job you'd like. It pays a salary, doesn't it? It means being out in all kinds of weather. So what? Don't forget it's laborers' work. What would your Tony friends say to that? <laughs> Nothing worse than they're saying now. I don't have any friends. Except you in Paris. Besides, what do I care what anybody says? I'll sell my house and move down to the railroad. Get a room at Mrs. Blake's boarding house. My Tony friends. I'll show those stuffed shirts that I can earn my own living. So, Drake joined the working class. He moved over to the other side of town. You could tell how upset he was, how he was trying hard not to show it. But you could tell just the same. It might have been different if he'd had some kind of word from Louise Gordon, but there was nothing. She was a prisoner in her father's house. Before the end of that summer, Drake had become a railroad switchman. The day I left for Vienna, he met me at the station. He took care of my bags while I said goodbye to Randy. That train seems a bit late. I'll miss you, Randy. Miss you, too. You... Will you write? Yeah. You don't sound very sure. I won't. Right off in Paris, just now and then, as a friend. You haven't changed your mind, have you? Not a bit, because I know I'm right. I, I want you to think of me like you think of Drake. I'm afraid that's impossible. Well, you'll find it easy after a while. Maybe. You know, it's funny. I, I don't think Drake even suspects the way I feel about you. He's been too occupied with his own worries. It's just as well that way. I suppose. Well, your trunks are all checked through. <laughs> A load of stuff you had, a person would think you were going to be gone for ten years. <laughs> well, thanks for taking care of them, Drake. Well, your train's coming in. I know. I'll, uh... I'll bet he'll forget all about us over there. Huh, Randy? Well, I've heard that Viennese girls are very beautiful. Yeah. I know where they're even more beautiful. You'll, uh, both write, won't you? Oh, sure, sure. Tell you all about the exciting life of a railroad switchman. <laughs> well, you two stick together. You're the only friends I've got. Oh, we will, kid. Take care of yourself. Sure. Hey, for time's sake, aren't you going to kiss Randy? Oh, yes, of course. Goodbye, Randy. Goodbye, Paris. So I went to Vienna. It was a very gay city, so different from the angular cold of King's Row. During the next three years, I found real satisfaction and contentment in my work. Randy was right. She had said over and over again that I would lose myself in my studies. But at the same time, I always looked forward to the day when I would return to King's Row. Their letters, Randy's and Drake's, were my only links with home. It gave me a secure feeling to know that I had two such friends. The thought that they might mean something more than that to each other never entered my mind. <laughs> Now I must tell you of certain events which I did not learn in full until I returned, but they fit into my story at this point. One January evening, Drake returned to his boarding house after dinner at Randy's. He took the shortcut through the freight yards as usual. They were shifting boxcars. They shouted and waved, but Drake couldn't hear them above the rattle and clash of wheels, so he just waved back and walked on for a moment. <laughs> Dr. Gordon on the phone. Tell him to get down here as quick as you can. Hey, what's happened? Get him. Oh, sure. Uh, operator. Operator, get me Dr. Gordon. Uh, what happened? Uh, an accident? Drake McHugh's been run over. What? Is he badly hurt? Can't tell yet. Well, how did it happen? Real crazy accident. You know that wagon load of tiles been standing up there on the edge of the cut? Uh, sure. It belongs to the tile works. We've been waiting for orders to ship it. The bank thawed out the, the whole wagon fell down. On Drake? Yeah, it, it hit him, pushed him under them cars. Bill Hawkinson's been shunting around. Run right over him? No, Bill was going slow. It just caught Drake as it stopped. Otherwise... Hello, Hello Dr. Gordon. Uh, Schultz at the freight yards. Been an accident. Drake McHugh. Uh, can you come right down? Uh, fine, Doc. What? Yes, Drake McHugh. <laughs> Uh, 
Still to call the hospital and tell him to get a room ready, Doc? No. What? There's not time. What do you mean, Doc? Just what I said. No time to take him to the hospital. I have to operate. Do it here. On this old table? We'll have to make out with what we've got. Yeah, but we could get him to a hospital in just a little Who's while. Who's the doctor around here, Schultz? You or I? Well, you, Doc. Well, then but... I'll make the decisions and give the orders. Sure, sure. What kind of an operation I'll you I'll need to... some help. What are you going to do? You, for... Davis, get me some blankets and a half dozen sheets anywhere here in the neighborhood and be quick. Yes, sir. Can you heat water on that stove, Schultz? Well, yes, Doc, right away. And then stand at that door and keep everybody out. I don't want a lot of numbskulls standing around staring. Anything I can do, Doc? Oh, Sam, I'm glad you're here. I'll uh, need somebody steady. Uh-huh. I, uh, I put the water on, Dr. Gordon. All right, now stand at that door. Not inside! Stay outside the door! Y- yes, sir. Yes. Now, Sam... Let me see. What'll have to be done, Doc? Amputation. His leg? Which one? Both of them. Close to the hips. Both of them? Yes. Let's get started. Louise, you're up rather late, aren't you? Yes, I am. What's the matter with you? I heard about Drake McHugh. Oh, I see. Mother told me about the call coming here for you. Did she? I stood it as long as I could. Then I went down to the railroad, the freight house where you performed the operation. You had no business there. You had just left. They'd carried Drake away. Some terrible old man was cleaning up where you had operated. I don't want to hear any more of this. It was most unbecoming of you to go down there, Louise, parading your feelings for Drake. I've wondered about you for years, Father. Now I know. You know nothing. What people have been saying about you. It's true. You're a monster. Louise. You hate people, don't you? You enjoy seeing them suffer. You try to hurt them. Oh, hit me. Hit me all you want. But you won't stop me from talking. You enjoy hitting me, don't you? Well, I'll let people know what you are. If it's the last thing I ever do. Be quiet. The bones in Drake's legs weren't even broken. I saw. I've suspected for some time about you and your operations. How you butcher and deform people. You don't know what you're saying. I've known for a long time. And now I'm going to tell. My arm. Let me go. You will say nothing, do you hear? Not a word. I will. I'll tell everybody. One word and I shall commit you to the state hospital. You wouldn't dare. I need only phone Dr. Peterson and you will be in a cell behind bars in one hour. Oh, no. I will have you declared insane. I'm not insane. And you know it. I know nothing of the sort. Father. Now go up to your room and stay there until I tell you to come downstairs. Yes, Father. If you disobey... Ever again, I shall have you put away, Louise. I take you in to see Drake, Mr. Schultz, but I just don't Uh, think... I I understand, Randy. I just wanted to stop by and inquire. Well, he's had sedatives ever since the accident. Then he... uh... Don't know yet about his legs? No. But the doctor stopped the injections this morning, so I guess it won't be long now. You're sure a godsend to him, Randy? Taking him into your house like this? I'm going to keep him here. I knew you would. I don't know what he'd do without you now. (gasps) Drake. Drake. Randy! Yes, yes, Drake, yes, yes, I'm here. Hush, darling, hush. I'm I'm, I'm here with you now. Randy. Don't try to talk. No. Accident. Yes. I was in an accident. Yes, dear, you were, but you're with me now, and, and you're going to get well now. Uh, Randy. Yeah, now, dear, be quiet. I... Well, I quiet. Don't move. Don't yeah. move about. Drake. Uh, Drake, give me your hand. Uh, uh, Please, Drake. Drake, don't. Randy! Drake, no! Randy! Where's the rest of me? <laughs> From 
Studio One, radio's celebrated playhouse of dramatic entertainment, you are hearing Mr. Robert Young, starring in King's Row by Henry Bellaman. One of the world's great stories in a special version for listening by Agnes Eckhart. Our story will resume after the customary pause for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Studio One, we continue tonight's full-hour dramatic entertainment. Robert Young stars in Fletcher Markle's production of King's Row by Henry Bellaman. I was still studying in Vienna when Randy sent me word of Drake's accident. I found her cable one afternoon when I came back to my boarding house. Randy's message drove all thoughts of the lecture I had attended out of my mind. I'll never forget the last words of that cable. I must keep Drake with me somehow. I cabled home that night and arranged to have part of my inheritance turned over to Drake, and I told Randy to stick with Drake until I got back. I said that we'd work things out, the three of us. Then, a week later, I got another cable. This one had only four words. Four words that changed all the plans I'd been making for my own future. Drake and I married. I didn't return to King's Row until a year later. Randy met me at the station. She found a carriage while I went to get my luggage. As we drove through town, she told me about Drake. So I'm afraid it's going to take a long time for Drake to develop any real sense of security. Yes, he was always so free and independent. Hmm. But we'll win, Randy. Yes, Paris, we will. Now that you're back. I rather imagine you've won most of the battle already. Paris, I, I... Let's talk about it, Randy, just this once. I was afraid to try to tell you in a letter how I felt about your marriage. Paris, I don't think... I know. You love Drake. You didn't look on the marriage as any sort of sacrifice. But I think it was one of the most courageous All things... All right, Paris. I'll say this once, and then we'll forget it. I do love Drake. He needs me, and I can help him. Randy, I love Drake, too, and I'm... Very happy that with all this tragedy, he at least has you. I wouldn't change that if I could. I understand. How uh, does he feel about Dr. Gordon? I've never let him hate or doubt Dr. Gordon. That would hurt Drake more than it would Gordon. Yes, of course. Oh, it's better this way. This is the only way. Did you hear? Paris Mitchell's back. He's Dr. Mitchell now. And he's on the staff out of the state hospital. One day, a patient was admitted with a severe abdominal condition requiring an immediate operation. The patient was Dr. Henry Gordon. He defiantly refused to be operated on. John McNeil, who was attending him, asked me in for consultation. It was at McNeil's request that I visited Dr. Gordon in his room. You're Dr. Mitchell now, I believe. Yes, Dr. Gordon. Yeah, it's been over in Europe learning all about what goes on inside people's minds, huh? <laughs> what makes them tick. <laughs> if anyone really can, no. You, uh, must find your work very interesting. Yes, but still it becomes routine. As well you know, Dr. Gordon. Routine, yes. Well, now let's get to the point of your visit, young fellow. Or perhaps I should be more respectful, Dr. Mitchell. Oh, nonsense. You knew Drake and me Why did you we... come here? Uh, Dr. McNeil asked me to see you. Did he? That's interesting. He feels, and so do I, that it's imperative you have an immediate operation. You certainly must understand this, Dr. Gordon. Yes, I think I understand well enough. If you delay much longer... Go ahead. Say it, Dr. Mitchell. If I delay much longer, I will probably die. That is correct. <laughs> At least that is what Dr. McNeil tells me. Have you doubts of Dr. McNeil's competence? I think you know he's as respected in the community as you yourself. I said you... I heard what you said. And I understand you don't question the diagnosis? Dr. McNeil is a capable man with a knife 
Then may I tell him you've agreed to the operation? No, I don't agree. Dr. Gordon, I... Get out of here. I'll never agree. No one will touch me. Doctor is a man of you science. You won't subject me to your pryings. I know why you came here. Dr. Gordon, I came here because I thought I might persuade you that an operation well, you would... you failed, Dr. Mitchell. Failed. No one shall ever take a knife to me. No one. Ever. <laughs> Dr. Henry Gordon was a man of science who had no faith in science. Three days later, he was dead. Largest funeral King's Rose ever seen. And he was a fine man, a humble man. I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure. Shortly after the funeral, I received a note from Dr. Gordon's wife asking me to call at my earliest convenience. Well, it's certainly been a long time since I've seen you, Dr. Mitchell, and you weren't a physician then. Of course, I've heard much about you. Louise was always talking of Paris Mitchell. And how is Louise, Mrs. Gordon? I haven't seen her since I came back. Well, it's in her regard that I wanted to speak to you. Is Louise ill? I don't know. Dr. Mitchell, I... I seriously fear her mind has been affected. You wish me to see her? Presently. First, let me explain... You may remember that some time ago, Louise had a most unfortunate attachment for one of the more undesirable boys in this town. Yes, Mrs. Gordon, I know about Louise and Drake McHugh. Oh. You might just as well tell me all that's happened. Dr. Mitchell, Louise hated her father. Really? Why was that? I could never guess. My husband was a saint. Yes, a saint. But after Drake McHugh had that accident, lost his legs... Louise made a terrible scene with her father. She said insane, unspeakable things. Then a few days later, that Drake was married. His wife was a... A, a Miss Monaghan. That's the girl. She, too, is a good friend of mine. Oh, really? Well, from that day on, Louise refused to leave her room. We could do nothing with her, nothing at all. Dr. Gordon was not really well at the time, and the, the burden of trying to manage her fell on me. Manage her? Oh, I don't mean that she was violent. She wouldn't speak. She did nothing but sit in her room. Then Dr. Gordon passed away. Now I have to tell you a terrible thing. Yes, Mrs. Gordon. When, when my dear husband was lying here in this room, Louise finally came downstairs. I found her... Striking her dead father in the face and, and cursing him. I see. I managed to get her upstairs without anyone knowing about the incident. I, I locked her in her room. That's why she wasn't at the funeral. And afterward? She showed no inclination to leave her room. And I decided it might be better to keep her door locked. No one knows but the two servants, but I'm sure there is talk. Have you heard anything at all? Not a word. This is the first. Dr. Mitchell, I'm desperate. I cannot bear the thought that my daughter would, would want to defame the memory of a great man. If I may, I'd like to see Louise now. Certainly, Dr. Mitchell. I'll take you upstairs, then I'll leave you to talk with her. <laughs> Louise. Paris? Yes. Paris Mitchell. I'm awfully glad to see you, Louise. It's been such a long time. Yes. A long time. You're Dr. Mitchell now. Yes. I'm not insane, Paris. Of course not. She thinks I am. My mother. Does she? It's a wonder I'm not insane. But I'm not. I know that, Louise. Have you seen Drake? Yes. How is he? As well as he can be. She married him. Yes, she takes good care of him, Louise. My father cut off Drake's legs. I know. I was there. You... you were where? Down at the freight house. I saw... I saw... You saw the operation? No. I was too late. If I'd gotten there sooner... I could have called Dr. Saunders or somebody, maybe. I saw... You saw what? I saw what was left on a table. The table he operated on. I'm not insane, Paris. I know, Louise. You must find out. There was a man who helped my father. You must talk to him. Maybe he'd know. Know what, Louise? I didn't believe it was necessary. My father cut off... Drake's legs on my account. What are you saying? You see? 
You think I'm crazy, too? No, Louise, I don't. But what you said surprised me. My father was a butcher. Louise. He was cold and cruel. He liked to torture people, enjoyed their suffering. You've got to believe me, Paris. This is my one chance telling, telling you. You've got to listen. I am listening. I've kept lists of father's operations, all of them. He liked to talk about them. Other doctors don't do that. And nearly always he said the patient's heart was too weak for chloroform. But their hearts were, were not too weak to be cut to pieces. I tell you, Paris, he liked to hear, to hear them scream. You don't think I'm insane. Say you don't. No, Louise. I want you to begin quietly. I want you to gather all the evidence. I want you Your to... Your father is dead, Louise. It's all over and done with. I want to destroy his memory. Paris, will you help me? Louise, there's something you must do yourself. Anything you say. You must get up tomorrow, dress and go out. Oh, no, no, I couldn't. You must. To show King's Row that you're not sick. You must let them see that you're well again. That will stop their talk. Would you go out with me the first time, Paris? Please? I wouldn't be afraid with you. You're the only person I can trust. Very well, Louise. I'll go out with you. <laughs> I thought at first that I could help Louise. I saw her several times a week. She started to go out a great deal. Even her mother felt she was getting well again. She never mentioned her father to me anymore. Yet, I could detect a slyness about her as time went on. She wasn't following any of my suggestions for the right reason, but for secret reasons of her own. I knew she had plans of some kind. I didn't realize how far they had progressed until one day when I went down to visit Drake. Randy was outside the house. I'm especially glad you came down today, Paris. Especially? Yes. Uh, let's just walk, shall we? Out this way. All right. Now, uh, and you better tell me what this is all about. I don't know how to begin. Just start. It's about you. Me? Yes. I've been hearing some stories that I don't quite understand. I thought I'd better let you know. Well, go ahead. People are saying that Louise Gordon has persuaded you to investigate and prove her charges against her father. Good grief. Are these stories true, Paris? Partly. How did you manage to see Louise? I thought her mother kept her locked up in the house. Her mother called me and asked me to see her. Louise told me things that, at first, I couldn't believe. They seemed to be part of her general hysterical condition. Things about her father? Terrible things. Unbelievable things. But the more she talked, the more I came to think that she might be telling the truth. I talked with Dr. Peterson at the hospital. We decided that we should try to keep Louise quiet. Wouldn't be right for people to find out about her father now that he's dead. And you didn't want to find out too much about him yourself, did you? Maybe. Because you're afraid, Paris. You're afraid of what you'd find out about Drake. Do you know any of the details of Drake's injury? He was not run over, if that's what you mean. He wasn't? No, he wasn't. Did you think so? That's what you cabled me. I was very upset at the time, Paris. Well, Drake was caught between two cars, but he was not run over by the wheels. I see. And now I've got to tell you something else. I made some inquiries after I heard all those terrible stories. And Sam Winters, down in the yards, helped Dr. Gordon. And he said... Go on, Randy, you've got to tell me. Sam Winters said it looked to him as if Drake was merely badly bruised. I can't believe that. He said, and these are his exact words... I looked good at them legs, and the bones in neither one of them was cracked up one bit. What Sam Winter says doesn't mean a thing. He's not a doctor. I know he's not a doctor, but I know what he saw. We well, must have been mistaken. Suppose he wasn't mistaken. Drake's injuries must have been serious. Suppose it wasn't. Look, Randy, this is something that's over and done with. We've got to forget about but it. But all these stories, Paris, those other operations, if they're true... We they're... must still forget them. Think what this would do to Drake if he found out. He started a new life. If he should ever find out that he didn't have to lose his legs, that Dr. Gordon didn't have to operate, I don't know what would happen to Drake. Yes, Chris, you're right. Even if this is true, Drake must never find out. After I talked with Randy, I went at once to see Louise. Now I could understand what was working in her mind. Louise was using me as a shield, as someone to prove that she was completely well. I feel wonderfully well. 
Nothing would make me happier than to feel that's really true. Oh, but it is. Well, you mustn't hurry yourself. You, you've been under strain for such a long time. Oh, Paris, you don't think I'd lie to you about myself. Why, I've never felt better in my life. Good. In fact, I feel well enough to visit Drake. Drake? What are you talking about? Oh, you'll take me to see him, won't you? Why do you want to see Drake? After all, I, I couldn't go there by myself, could I? I I've never met his Why wife. Why do you want to see Drake? I want them to be my friends, Paris, both of them. I want that so very much. And I want to talk with Drake. There's so much I want to tell him. No, that's impossible. You won't ta take me to see Drake? Never. I'll do everything I can to prevent you from seeing him. Oh, Paris. Drake must never know the things you've told me about your father. Your daughter needs a change of scene. Well, I suppose that could be arranged. Her health would improve if you could get her away from this house. I've been thinking for some time of a trip down south. Excellent. Take her away from King's Row. Perhaps that would be best. And do it as quickly as possible. Did you hear? Louise Gordon and her mother have gone to Florida. Uh, that girl's a strange one, like her father. Wish I could afford to spend the winter in Florida. Louise had been gone about two months when I received a long letter from her mother. It read in part, My daughter's general condition has not improved. In fact, it's gotten much worse. It has seemed best, in my judgment, to have her confined in a sanitarium. A wave of sickness swept over me as I finished the letter. The word confined glared up from the page. I could easily guess what had happened in Florida. It would not have been difficult for Mrs. Gordon to drive Louise to violence. She had deliberately sacrificed the possibility of her daughter's recovery to her own pride in her husband's memory. This was another of the town's good people, kind-hearted, reliable. This was part of King's Row. But at least Drake was saved from any suspicion that his operation had not been necessary. When I visited him that night, his high spirits did quite a little to raise my own. <laughs> Say, Paris, you know we're getting rich. Well, I'm glad, Drake. That's fine. I mean, you too. Are you still talking about that money? I... Now, listen, Paris. Randy and I consider that a loan. It was wonderful of you to do it, but we'll have it no other way. Yes, Please, but Please, I... Paris, I know that's how Drake wants it. I told you we'd gone into the real estate business on a small scale, and now you're a partner. All right, uh... Tell me about our business. <laughs> oh, we've been unbelievably lucky. Drake makes all the plans and I carry them out. We finished selling out the Sheely track entirely. <laughs> How's that for a girl who didn't know anything about business and an old cripple piled up in bed, huh? <laughs> You're going to be rich one day, I can see that. And you with us. Yeah. What's the matter, Paris? Oh, nothing, just a little tired. I think I'll run on. Uh, you suppose you'd give me a cup of coffee first, Randy? Of course, come on out in the kitchen. See you soon, Drake. Yeah, so long, Paris. Don't uh, bother to make the coffee, Randy. Oh, what's the matter, Paris? Is, is Drake... Oh, he's all right. I just wanted to say that I think we've won in a very ticklish fight. I didn't know a year ago whether we could bring Drake back or not. I think we have. You've done the biggest share of it. I did just what you told me, nearly as I could. You've been pretty wonderful, Randy. Drake's all right now. He's just Drake now. What about you? Me? Mm -hmm. Why... <laughs> Well, what do you mean? I've known ever since you got back to King's Row that you're not happy. Well, I didn't like King's Row very much when I came back. Yes, I could see that. You're probably the only one who did. I felt you were staying on here because of Drake. Drake and... And now I have the feeling that you want to go away. Go away? You don't? Well, yes and no. I just like King's Row now, the people and what they stand for. Yet this is my home. But you're not happy. I can see it in your face. Who is, completely? Paris? Yes? Maybe you ought to get married. No, Randy. Paris, you might... I can't marry just for the sake of marriage. There must be more than that. But you might meet somebody you'd really love more than you ever... Than I ever what? Was <laughs> his fault losing his money? They say his wife's mighty clever. I hear she's the one swings all those business deals. They've made a pack of money. Yes, they've made plenty of money. Yeah, money always does it. 
Randy Monahan, the girl from across the tracks, was now accepted, welcomed in the best homes of King's Row. She and Drake and I used to have many laughs over it. After each new business deal, we watched the effect it had on the town. That winter, I spent much time organizing notes for a book I was going to write. I didn't see a great deal of Drake. Then one night, Randy called and asked if I'd come over right away. Harris, thank heavens you got here so quickly. What is it, Randy? You sounded worried on the phone. I am. Drake? Yes. What's wrong? He's in a great deal of pain. It's his hip. It's been bothering him all winter. He's been complaining, but I thought it was just fatigue. Well, has Dr. McNeil seen him? Yes, this morning. What did he say? Enough to frighten me. Randy, what are you talking he about? He didn't say anything exactly, but I gathered that something might be wrong with the bone. Well, why didn't McNeil call me? Because he had to go to Springfield this afternoon. He said he'd call you on Thursday. Paris, I, I want you to promise me... I want you to promise me you'll tell me the truth, whatever it is. Yes, Randy, I'll tell you. Whatever it is. Dr. McNeil thinks it's, uh... Best to have some specialists come down from Chicago for consultation. To see if, if they should operate? No, I don't believe they'd want to operate. No, Paris, don't try to shield me. It isn't fair. Why, why, why wouldn't they operate? It would be useless. The pelvic structures involved, there are certain indications of further spread. How long he... I don't know. Well, what does Dr. McNeil say? Perhaps six months, but... There are always unpredictable factors. You talk like a doctor. Listen, Paris, I've got to know something. Well? Could Drake's... What did the amputation have to do with this? I don't know. What do you think? I'm telling you the truth when I say I don't know. Paris, I could stand anything for myself, but Drake... Hasn't he had enough? I know. It's Drake I'm worrying about. Days, weeks, and months that followed seemed to stand still. Injections of morphine kept Drake's mind clouded most of the time. The afternoon of the last day he seemed clearer. Randy and I sat by his bed. I... I... Uh, yes, Drake? What is it you want? Want? Yes. I want to say something. You shouldn't talk. Randy? I'm here, Drake. Paris here? Yes. <laughs> like old times, huh? That's right, dear. Remember? Remember what, Drake? The day you left Paris, going to, going to Vienna. I remember, Drake. Remember what you said? You said you two stick together. I know what you meant now. I feel the same now. I'm going away. You two stick together. Yeah. Stick together. After Drake died, months went by without my even seeing Randy. I spent most of my time working at the hospital or taking long walks alone. These walks were usually outside of the town, toward the unfamiliar country. But one day, the following spring, an impulse I fought yet couldn't resist, led me toward Union Street, past the house where Drake used to live, past the old Gordon home. The garden swing was still in the yard, the swing where Louise and Drake were sitting that day so long ago seemed I was reliving the whole thing. I remembered that day so well, every detail of it. Drake and Louise had quarreled. Then Drake and I had left. Then a girl walked up to us and said, Hello, Paris Mitchell. Uh, hello. Uh, you act as if you hardly remember me. Randy. Just like that day a long time ago. <laughs> I, I was uh, thinking of that day. So was I. I remember I thought you were the prettiest girl in the world. Thanks, Perry. I still do. We, uh, went on a picnic. Yes. It was a day just like this. I could fix a lunch just like the one I fixed before. All right. Let's have another picnic. Just like before. I, uh, think you'd find my shoulder a little more comfortable than leaning against that tree. <laughs> there. Oh, my darling, I... I've never stopped loving you. I wish I could make you understand. I never stopped loving you either. Randy. My love for you was... 
apart from my life, but it was always there. Look at me. Hmm? You said that summer you'd never marry me because I didn't need you. You know you were wrong now, don't you? Yes, darling. People need each other when they're in love. As we are in love? As we are in love. Paris? Yes, darling. Drake would be very happy. Yes, darling, I know he would. For both of us. Yes, as I said, I often walk up to the hills in the spring and look down on King's Row. I've known its hatred and cruelties and its sins. And yet my roots are here. For here, too, I've found love. And for me, King's Row is home. Studio One at CBS, you have just heard Mr. Robert Young, starring in Fletcher Markle's production of King's Row by Henry Bellman. Another of the world's greatest stories from radio's celebrated playhouse of dramatic entertainment. Tonight's script was especially prepared for this series by Agnes Eckhart, and the original music was composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Now again, Mr. Markle. May a producer identify the principals in our cast tonight. In the foreground, Harris Mitchell. Was played, of course, by Mr. Young. Randy Monaghan. Was played by Mercedes McCambridge. Drake McHugh. Was Leon Janney. Dr. Gordon. Was Everett Sloan. Louise Gordon. Was Catherine McGregor. Mrs. Gordon. Was played by Miriam Wolfe. Actively assisting in the cast were Robert Dryden, Brainerd Duffield, Alan Devitt, Louis Quinn, Joan Castle, and Ian McAllister. Robert Young may currently be seen in Columbia's Technicolor production, Relentless. Now as to next week. Next week, from Studio One, we have a most happy and fortunate combination. Our story is one of quiet terror and curious revenge. Uncle Harry by Thomas Job. And our star is the brilliant young English actor who created the title role on the London stage, Mr. Michael Redgrave. We hope you'll be with us. Now until next week, this is Fletcher Markle with a good night and thank you from all of us in Studio One. This is Lee Vines and this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.